Module number three. This deals into the world of cryptography. We're actually going to spend about, uh, we're going to spend this week and next week in the world of cryptography just because it is that big. Uh, I will do my best to avoid any and all math. So for those of you who, like me, uh, math is not their thing, you're fine. And if math is your thing, then I have a thing for you too. But not a requirement. Uh, just because we're talking about crypto, I found this picture. All right. Cryptography is its own world, and it has its own verbiage that goes with it. Like uh, steganography, if you ever see that, that is just hiding information within an image. That is not necessarily cryptography, even though it is a form of taking information and basically hiding it. it may not be in the same way as cryptography does but you're still hiding information encryption it, the true self really has three terms that go with it and that's plain text cipher text and clear text so plain text is your unencrypted data before it gets through the, the math to become encrypted. Ciphertext is the output of that, which is uh, scrambled and unreadable. And clear text is the readable or the unencrypted data. You gotta think of cryptography like math in the sense of like a, a formula. You have your input, you have your output. Your algorithms are the mathematical formulas that use keys and keys are the mathematical value to encrypt or decrypt data. They are the function that causes data to go from being readable to becoming completely unreadable and back. So here's an example. We have our plain text information. We use a key and we use math to turn that into what looks like garbage we can send that garbage out through the web and out back, we can use the same key to decrypt and now we can read the plain text information. The oldest of the, of the world of crypto is the, uh, the Caesar cipher, which basically took the alphabet and moved it 13 spaces. So an a, an a would be an N, a B would be an O, so on and so forth. We have the XOR cipher based on the binary exclusive OR. This will take, this is just another way of taking information and encrypting it and be able to decrypt it later. A tool that you should be familiar with, that you, uh, that like myself, who is not uh, much of a math fan, but I love using tools, um, I highly encourage you to use CyberChef. I will put the link in CyberChef in our chat on Discord. You can just Google CyberChef and it, it's the first link you see. It has a ton of tools that you can use for encryption and decryption that'll help you in various uh, contests that you'll participate in, in uh, uh, CTFs and, and challenges that you will create and solve uh, all around. Great tool, free to use, awesome stuff. Cryptography depends on the infrastructure that you use. So if you know what number is being used as a key into a mathematical formula, you can solve what anything that goes through it will be on the other end. That's, that is the, the worst case scenario for encryption. Uh, in our world, cryptography answers actually five things. So it answers the CIA triad. It, it answers confidentiality in the sense of only authorized parties can view it by using the key. It satisfies integrity 
because the data can only be altered if you have the key. If you don't have the key and you try altering it, the data will be corrupted. Because the data is corrupted and uh, no one else can see it, this is, we render the data safe. Uh, it answers authentication because the sender has to be authenticated. We can't, you can't impersonate the person who is truly sending this information in an encrypted fashion. We also answer non-repudiation, which means you can't deny that you were the one who sent it, and obfuscation. We're hiding the original message so that it cannot be determined by somebody who is unauthorized to read it. Cryptography provides the protection in all three states, the data in use, data in transit, and data at rest. The data in use when it's running through the CPU, data in transit when we're sending it over the internet, and data at rest when it's stored on a USB stick or a hard drive. To that end, we do have restrictions that are set by the hardware. If, like IoT, there isn't enough CPU power to handle encrypting and decrypting, then encryption will either be non-existent or very weak. This is why things like LED lights and the Nest device and other smart home devices don't have encryption in place and are perfect tools to get into a network. A device that will encrypt information has to have enough energy, has to have enough low latency and to be able to handle strong security. And most IoT devices do not have this and that's why they are generally insecure and causes all grief. Again, I'm gonna do my best to avoid the math behind it. I'll talk about it, but I'm not gonna make you do math. So the first cryptographic algorithm that we'll cover is the hash algorithm. These create digital fingerprints. So it'll take data, put it into a fixed size, it should be unique and original and irreversible. So in this case, I have lsr.exe. I want to make a fingerprint of it. So this program made an MD5, a SHA-1, SHA-256, and SHA-512. These hashes should not be uh, reproducible without the file itself. If I take this lsr.exe and I send it to somebody else, they should be able to get the same, uh, the same hash to verify that they have the file. But if a third person tries to recreate the, the hash, they should not be able to. The only way that you can reproduce the same, the same uh, hash is if you have the entire file in the same way that I had it when I created the hash. It should be unique. No, two files should not create the same hash. If so, we have a problem. And we have that problem with MD5 and SHA-1. It is possible to do what's called a collision where two files generate the same hash. That's not good. Uh, MD5 is your oldest. It is the most used, is one of the most used because it's, it's small. Its length only goes to 512 bytes. It, its math uses four variables of 32 bytes in a round robin fashion. Uh, SHA-1 came out in 93. It has six variations and you see uh, two of the, or three of them there. Uh, SHA-3 was supposed to come out in 2015, but it, uh, not really to replace, but more of providing security to low power devices. It is way bigger, as you can see uh, here. Handles up to 160 bits with messages of uh, greater than 512 bytes having zero uh, as an integer in order to make sure everything's padded. 
The other two that you should be familiar with and just by, uh, by knowing uh, is the RACE, the Race Integrity Primitive Evaluation Message Digest, and the Hash Message Authentication Code. Really knowing the acronym for those last two is good enough, but knowing uh, the, the length of MD5 and SHA-1 will be useful when you take the Security Plus test. The two main forms of cryptographic algorithms other than hashes are symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric was the first to come about because it's the easiest. Two people have to have the exact same key in order to unlock or lock the, the information. So think of a house key. If two people live in the same house, they need to have the same key in order to open the lock. That is a symmetric cryptographic algorithm. The oldest from 1970 is Data Encryption Standard or DES. That has been totally defeated. You should never use that. It was replaced by Triple DES, which is basically doing DES three times. Also something you should, probably should not use. Instead, you should use the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. Uh, it has been around since the late 2000s, but it is, uh, it's stronger since it performs three steps for every 128-bit blocks of plain text. Depending on the key size, it will do multiple rounds. So the, these number of rounds against the plain text information cut makes it harder to reverse. As of yet, we don't have any successful attacks to AES. You also should be familiar in this realm of symmetric cryptography with the Rivest cipher or the RC, who has six uh, different algorithms and they're labeled RC one through six. Uh, you should also be familiar with Blowfish, which is a 64-bit block cipher, and it has a variable key length of 32 to 448 bits, and IDEA, the International Data Encryption Algorithm. That is a European algorithm. Questions so far? Okie dokie. In the asymmetric world, we use different keys to encrypt and decrypt information. These are known as the public and the private key. The private key is the one that is known only to individual who it belongs to. The public key is known to everybody and is freely distributed. This is what we use when it comes to things like HTTPS certificates. We don't have the private key to Amazon, Amazon does, but we can safely browse to Amazon by using the public private key pair. Another example would be like a mailbox. Only one person has the key to open the mailbox, but anybody can drop uh, something into the, the mailbox. So in asymmetric, you have the key pairs, the public and private, and you also have that the keys can be used both ways. The keys can be used to both decrypt and encrypt data. The most common in the realm of asymmetric is RSA. That has been around since 1977 and has a pretty complicated way of securing information. Uh, if you are looking at the lecture notes, I have the steps, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps in order to take data through RSA to be encrypted. Uh, this is just to show you the, the madness of the math. You have to take two prime numbers that are uh, labeled as P and Q. You multiply those two large prime numbers to solve for N, another variable. So then you have to calculate M equals P minus one times Q minus one. I'm already falling asleep. 
Uh, you find the number, another variable E, so that E and M have no common positive divisor other than one. You calculate them together and you find the public and private keys. Honestly, I prefer using tools to do all this. Another way that we use asymmetric cryptography is elliptic curve cryptography. It's been around since the 80s using a graph. We make a gently curved line, add the values of two points on the line. We derive a third point from those. Uh, the users will share the elliptic curve and one point on the curve while choosing a secret random number and compute the private key based on that point. You normally find elliptic curve cryptography in cell phones and wireless devices since these keys are smaller and can be used in faster computations with less power. So yes, your cell phone does this without you even knowing. There's also the digital signature algorithm. This was created by uh, our government and patented under NIST. This verifies that the sender is the sender and provides integrity to the message. So if somebody is sending a message, they can sign it with a digital signature to prevent uh, anyone else from taking uh, the right of saying, I created this. It proves who did it. In order to exchange keys, because the, the answer of asymmetric to symmetric is in symmetric, we have to have, we have to share the key. So if anybody takes the key uh, or makes a copy of it, now all our security is thrown out the window. With asymmetric having two different keys, you can't necessarily do that. But we do need to have a way to share keys as needed. And there are four main ways which again, all resolve in math. And uh, those are the Diffel-Hellman, DH, the Diffel-Hellman ethereal, the, ep the epileptic curve, Diffel-Hellman, and the perfect forward secrecy. Again, for the Security Plus, you don't have to know the math behind it. You can if you want, if you're so inclined. Uh, but knowing the terms, knowing what they mean, knowing the acronyms will help you in understanding the questions and being able to, uh, to answer and get your Security Plus cert. Now all this math exists because people have been breaking it. So it has gotten harder and harder with every, it's like a, it's a, it's a big cat and mouse game of solving, uh, solving this in order to be able to reach information being sent. For example, if we know that English is the, the language that is being used, we can start inferring some statistical information. Being it in English, we know that E is the most commonly letter used. So we can see any patterns where E should be. Well, we can distinguish between actual ciphers and null messages with null ciphertext. And also knowing the size of information can help us in breaking through what, you know, what's behind. You can also use things like downgrade attack. So instead of using something like SHA-512, can we get you to use MD5 instead? Uh, using deprecated algorithms, instead of using AES, can I get you to uh, communicate with me using DES instead. Improper implementation. If the administrator did not properly set uh, the encryption, uh, the, whatever software is going to do the encryption properly, that can be broken in order to get through. And collision attacks. Having uh, files cause the same hash, even though they're completely different files. These are all things that we have to be aware about in whenever we use 
any cryptographic algorithms. In practical sense, we use encryption to through, to through things like pretty good privacy that uses both asymmetric and symmetric cryptography at once in order to encrypt files and decrypt them. We also use encryption in things like operating systems. For example, the encrypting file system in Windows. Apple uses File Vault. Linux uses Lux. These are all ways that we use these, these mathematical formulas to secure our information from others who are not authorized to see the information. You can also use hardware. For example, there are USB drives that are tamper-proof. And if you have ever seen uh, the iron key, that is one of the most common tools that are, uh, that are used to encrypt data. This thing, if you try to break it open, it has a little acid that will burn out the chip. Which again, it is better that the information be lost than be read in the sense of encryption. There are also self-encrypting drives similar to the iron key. There's these trusted platform modules that I'm showing you uh, on the lower left. These are, a, are chips that are dedicated to doing any of the cryptographic math. That way it's not done by the CPU. You also have hardware security modules, which are network appliances built to do the encryption decryption for several systems. Hardware security modules are, uh, tend to be used on websites. So uh, big sites like Amazon and Google, they'll have dedicated systems to do nothing but the encryption decryption for all the traffic that's coming in and out. I went through a whole lot. Do you guys have questions? Okay, I see nopes. So let's 